Society, one of the foremost thought experts on astronomy in our community. So without further ado, Dr. Bill Bustler. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to present this program again because it's one of the few that I do that has any sort of practical value. Most of the time I'm talking about black holes or something, and unless you fall into one, you uh, really wouldn't get much good out of it. But this one tells you a little bit about how telescopes work, uh, how to set up your telescope and get the most out of it, and then how to find things with it, which we'll do during the second half. Now, how many of you have a new telescope that you haven't quite gotten the hang of using yet? Is it okay, so I wish you all were in the front row, but uh, <laughs> uh, there's still some seats down here. We don't take up a collection, so if you want to get a little closer to the action, uh, feel free to move on down. If you have a telescope of any kind, it's almost certainly one of three different major types. The first type that everybody thinks of and that we will cover first is a refractor telescope. Uh, this is what a telescope like this looks like. You have a lens up in the front and it focuses the light towards the back and you look in uh, through the back end of the telescope at the distant objects. So there are all kinds of refractor telescopes but that's the basic layout of a refractor. Uh, here's uh, a rather inexpensive department store type telescope. Here's a high-end one with uh, very sophisticated lenses and mountings. And when you get down to it, binoculars are refractor telescopes as are monoculars. And this is a large professional uh, telescope. This is the 26-inch telescope at the U.S. Uh, Naval Observatory which is on the grounds of the vice president's dwelling in Washington. Or another way to put it is the vice president lives on the grounds of the <laughs> Naval Observatory. Uh, I've looked through this telescope and it's quite impressive even in downtown Washington. Uh, the largest one I've looked through is a 30 inch refractor at uh, Allegheny Observatory in Pittsburgh. And we saw Pluto through that telescope. Our friend Dan Fundo is also at uh, from Pittsburgh and is, is very familiar with that observatory. And the largest one in the world is the 40 inch refractor at Yerkes Observatory in uh, uh, Wisconsin, which is actually run by the uh, University of Chicago. Come on. Okay. The reflector telescope, and we'll certainly go into a little more depth than that. We're just sort of touching base on the different types here. The reflector telescope has an entirely different principle of gathering light. Instead of a lens in the front, there's, whoops, a mirror in the, uh, in the back. Let's try that again. One more try. Okay. A mirror back here gathers the light that comes in through the front reflects it up towards the front end of the telescope. And in this particular case, it bounces off of a diagonal mirror up near the front and out the side where we observe it. Other types, as we'll see, have another uh, mirror here that reflects the light back down through the uh, hole in the main mirror. But the main idea of the reflector is that it's got a mirror to reflect the light and gather it rather than a lens. And there are a lot of different kinds of reflector telescopes as well. Uh, here's a famous Dobsonian telescope. That's, uh, it's a basic reflector, Newtonian design, meaning it has the diagonal mirror that reflects the light out to the side. But it's on an interesting kind of base that sits flat on the ground and is made of relatively inexpensive materials that are easy to transport. Uh, here's a classic reflector telescope with an equatorial mount. We'll see more about those later, but this is commercially available. Here's a rather large version of one of those, and here's a very small version of one of these. Edmund Scientific Company, a number of years ago, uh, marketed this thing, the Astro, Astro Scan 2000. They had a contest for the naming the telescope. That was not my suggestion. I suggested the Red Dwarf, but they... Uh, <laughs> 
they went with AstroScan 2000. And it was long before 2000. So I don't know where they came up with that. Uh, then here's an enormous Dobsonian telescope that reminds me a lot of Jeremy's. It takes uh, several people in very good condition to carry it around and set it up. And then here's a professional observatory reflector telescope as well. Then there's a third type that's kind of a hybrid of the other two, reflector and refractor. And it's called a catadioptric. Now this isn't a typo here, there is an R in there. It's not optic as you might think, it's optric, so catadioptric. So you can show off to your friends when you go home from the meeting and tell them you learn about catadioptric telescopes. Here is one that has uh, a mirror in the back so that it is a reflector, but it also has a corrector plate in the front that acts sort of like a lens. And as we'll see, it makes up for uh, deficiencies in the main mirror so that you can have this lens-like corrector plate and the uh, main mirror in the back. So it's kind of some of each, reflect, reflector and refractor. Here's some uh, commercial ones that are uh, well known and uh, reasonably good. Here's kind of a diagram of one first. You can see the corrector plate that the light enters through bounces off the main mirror in the back up to a secondary mirror, uh, which is just behind the corrector plate, which sends the light back down through a hole in the main mirror. And then you can observe the image through the eyepiece there. This is a Mead uh, catadioptric scope, and here's one made by Celestron. Those are the two main manufacturers of commercial catadioptric telescopes. Looking more at the refractor, taking a little closer look at them. A refractor is based on the principle that when light passes through a lens or lenticular shaped piece of material, it's thicker at the center than at the edges, the light waves are focused to a point and an image of the object is formed there as we'll see. We think of light waves as proceeding along when it passes through a lens, the waves are bent and delayed more at the center than at the edges, so that they all converge to a point there, which, as we'll see, is the, where the focus of the lens is. The reason this happens is because light is actually slowed down when it's passing through glass. That's the most amazing thing I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's got to be on the list of the top few amazing things. The second part is even more amazing than the first. But it speeds right back. Right, right again yeah. It comes out. So it's uh, all you can say is the light waves think they're going to their speed of light wherever they are. It just turns out differently depending on where they are. So the, uh, we all know about the figure of 186,000 miles per second or 300 million meters per second, but that's in a vacuum. And it doesn't slow down much going through the air, but it does slow down some, as you can see uh, bending of light. Uh, uh, you see the moon doesn't look perfectly round when it's on the horizon because of the atmospheric refraction. There are other displays of that, but uh, air doesn't really have a whole lot of effect. But when you run it through a piece of glass, the light uh, slows down to maybe a, a third off of the top speed down to about 50% of its speed as it was going into the glass. So all while it's going through the glass, it's going slower. And of course, in the middle, it's going through a thicker part of the glass, so it stays slow down for longer. And then here is what Rick was talking about. Uh, well, that actually wasn't, that's what I just said. The uh, slowing down brings the light to a focus. Uh, an analogy that I use on this sometimes is, uh, yeah, if you had a marching band or suppose we just front two rows of people joined hands and ran across the soccer field. Tonight you'd probably run into a big puddle and it might be elliptical shape or even lenticular, who knows? And if that's the case, then those slogging through the middle would be slowed down more than the ones who just barely went through the edges 
and they would lag behind the ones near the edges. But if when you come out of the puddle, you're still running straight ahead as far as you're concerned, you'll see they'll all eventually wind up in a pile at the focal point where everybody piles together. So that's what happens uh, in the lens. Now the uh, image of the object is uh, formed at that point, at the focus. And as Rick was saying, when the light comes back out of the lens, it speeds back up to its speed in the vacuum or air again, which is, uh, as he says, one of the most uh, marvelous things that we have to deal with. But, you know, physicists do things like that. They come up with these preposterous ideas and somebody tests them out and sure enough, it's true. And then everybody gets Nobel prizes and then they <laughs> go on to the next thing. So that's the way physics works. You can't really look at the image. If you just held a lens up and looked through it, you wouldn't see anything but just big fuzzy blobs of light because your eyes are not set up to uh, take in bundles of light that are converging. It has to be almost parallel to go through your, the lens of your eye and then focus on the retina. The lens of your eye works exactly the same way, except it's adjustable until you get to a certain age. <laughs> and it's not adjustable anymore, uh, which means you've got to have adjustable glasses in front of it. So anyway, the uh, light does come to a focus there, but you can't look at it because the light rays are not parallel. So you have to do something to straighten out the uh, light uh, bundle so that it's now entering your eye in parallel rays. And the most common way of doing that in an ordinary telescope is by putting another lens called an eyepiece back behind the focal point. So as the light is starting to diverge again, then it encounters this other smaller lens and straightens back out again. So the light waves, as you see here, are parallel as they enter your eye, and then you can actually view the object. This, of course, since the light waves have crossed right here, makes the image you're looking at uh, upside down. But in astronomy, that's not a big problem. You know, a star being a pinpoint looks pretty much the same right side up as upside down. Uh, planets and the moon, you get used to it. You just turn your chart upside down and it lines up just fine. Uh, now, if you're using it for other purposes, like looking in somebody's bedroom window, shame on you, but that image will be upside down as well. But we're supposed to concentrate on other kinds of heavenly bodies than that. So, <laughs> so we uh, have an inverted image with an astronomical telescope. Now, there's a few problems with refractor telescopes, uh, especially with the less expensive ones. Almost any problem can sort of be fixed. That's kind of a general rule of the universe, isn't it? You can't ever fix a problem entirely as if it weren't there, but you can alleviate it and make it where it's, you can deal with it. So chromatic aberration is one of the problems with a refractor telescope's lens. And that's because uh, the different wavelengths or colors of light are refracted or bent to a different degree. The more energetic the light is towards the blue and violet end of the spectrum, the glass has a greater effect on slowing it down and speeding it up. And the end result is the blue light comes to a focus sooner than the lower energy light that's in the red end of the spectrum. So what happens if you go to look at a star through a telescope that's set up like this? Well, depending on where you have focused the eyepiece, you'll either see a, a blue star with a red halo around it or a red star with a blue halo around it or some combination in between. None of them satisfactory. Now, if you're just into psychedelic sights and things like that, well, that, that could be good. But uh, for astronomical work, this just won't do. So what we normally do is to make a compound lens made up of two or sometimes three different kinds of glass, usually crown and flint glass, which have slightly different optical properties. And one of them more or less undoes the chromatic aberration from the other. Uh, more or less. 
you can pick any one wavelength in between or any two across the spectrum where it's in sharp focus. Everything else is not quite, but it's better than if you didn't try. So that's kind of the problem solving uh, paradigm is you pick what you want to fix most of all and fix that and other things will kind of follow along. Uh, some really expensive refractors have uh, three lenses uh, instead of two and they can either be cemented together or spaced with a little air in between them. So this tends to make refractor telescopes expensive because you have to have four or six surfaces, each one of them perfectly made and perfectly aligned with each other. So that takes some workmanship and that's why good refractor telescopes uh, will set you back quite a bit. One of the advantages is that you don't normally have to align a refractor. Once you make the lenses and put them in your their cell and screw that onto the front of the telescope, it's good to go. Uh, now that's not to say that you can't misalign them. At one point we had a member who used to carry his refractor telescope around in the back bed of his pickup truck, just bouncing around on these country roads and everything. And he wondered why his images weren't all that sharp. Well, the problem was that he wasn't either, so that was... <laughs> so we normally don't have to align the refractor. Uh, the very design of them with a long focal length, as we'll see very soon, lends them to high magnification. And for the things that are, uh, that you most likely want to look at at first, the moon and planets, because those are things you've heard of, uh, uh, high magnification is very desirable because these are small things. You might think of the moon and planets in the sky as being very prominent. Well, they're bright. But compared to a lot of things we look at, they're actually small in angular diameter in the sky. So you need something that can give you high magnification to blow them up. By the way, this is a good point at any to point out uh, what the purpose of a telescope is. If you took a survey, and I won't embarrass anybody by taking a survey because I was formerly on the wrong side of this, the purpose of a telescope is not to make things bigger. It's not magnification. That's a secondary thing. It's to gather light, more light than your eye. The diameter of a telescope is much greater. Even the smallest telescope has got a much greater diameter than the pupil of your eye. So more light is gathered and then you can do whatever you want to with it. Look at it as it is or magnify it to whatever degree you want. But the main purpose is to gather light so you can do something with it. The diameter of a refractor telescope is limited by the inherent nature of the thing. Uh, like I said, the largest one is 40 inches in diameter. If you start making uh, lenses bigger than that, remember they have to be supported by the edges because the light has to go through it. You can't build a framework behind it to hold it in place. So if it's held uh, around the edges, the thing can sag depending on which way you turn it in the sky. The lens actually changes its shape a little bit and assuming it was good in one position, any other position is not good. So you have a compromise again. So that's why the limiting uh, size has already been reached. There's probably never going to be a bigger refractor. And as I already mentioned, they're subject to chromatic aberration and relatively high cost because of all the workmanship involved in making all the surfaces and lining them up with each other. And as I said, they're good for small bright objects, as moon, planets, and double stars, which makes them pretty good starter telescopes because when somebody goes to the department store and buys a telescope, all they know about is the moon and planets. They don't know about NGC galaxies and things. So uh, they uh, probably don't have any reason to consider anything else but one of these, and uh, they are good for starting. Then when you move on, you sell it to somebody else or store it and have a collection of telescopes over the years, which some people do. A little more about reflectors. Here's a Celestron reflector. We're not pushing any uh, 
different companies or anything, but when I downloaded the pictures, I got some that showed the whole telescope and it didn't have a special sign stuck on it and it was reasonably sharp. So that's how these pictures were selected off the internet, not by any commissions they gave me. Here we see that a concave mirror at the back end of the telescope gathers the light as it comes in and as it bounces off the surface of the mirror, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So since this is tilted, it reflects all the light waves back to a point, just like a lens does, except uh, with a whole different principle of reflecting instead of refracting. Now, light waves are all bounced off of a surface with exactly the same angle. It's not like the chromatic aberration you see in a refractor lens where the blue is uh, focused shorter and the red waves longer. Everything comes to the same point. So in a reflector telescope, you don't have any such thing as chromatic aberration, which is a big advantage just right off the bat. Also, the mirror itself does need to be parabolic in cross-section, or paraboloidal in three dimensions. Um, it's not exactly the same as a sphere, but you could never tell the difference between that and a sphere just by looking at it. Only when you start to look through the telescope would you see the difference. A spherical mirror will not reflect all the incoming waves to the same point, not because of a different color, but where it comes in on the mirror. If it comes near the edges, it'll come to a different focal point than when it's near the center. And that, again, is not good. You don't see the halo of psychedelic colors, but your image will be fuzzy and you can make it look good in any different part of it, running the focus in and out, but that's not what you want to do. So you have to use a parabolic mirror, which uh, almost can't be machine made. You can make a spherical mirror on a machine, but then it takes hand polishing to convert the sphere into a parabola. And at that point, you're not grinding a lot of glass away. You're just kind of buffing it off with very fine material that removes like thousandth of a millimeter of glass here and there, and that converts it into a parabola for those who've made mirrors. We've got some here who have, <laughs> have made mirrors. <clears throat> in between riding dinosaurs around the yard. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing is back in the day when you made 50 cents an hour bagging groceries or something, you couldn't go out and buy a Celestron catadioptric telescope. You had to buy a mirror making kit which had a couple of pieces of glass and some different grades of abrasives and you'd made your own. And that was the way everybody did it back then. By the way, the Memphis Astronomical Society has some mirror-making kits, mm -hmm. if anybody's interested in tackling that. And if, tempt them. And if you ever... <laughs> <laughs> that way, Lee. Realizing a mirror yeah. is the next closest thing to insanity. <laughs> well, it's like a lot of things. It can be done. It's a combination of science, art, and luck. And um, you can actually get it to work. And I... Seen some of the, the yeah, occasionally Wilson Northcross comes. He's another one who uh, made his own telescope and uh, developed some really good tools for doing the parabolizing various optical tests. So it can be done. We spent many a Saturday morning walking around with a 55-gallon drum. Yeah, you, yeah, you have to get at it from all sides. So a 55-gallon drum is the right, table right. of choice for making a mirror. I guess if you put it on a square table, you'd wind up with a square figure after a while. <laughs> but anyway, meanwhile, back to the subject at hand, you can make mirrors a lot larger. For one thing, you've only got one surface that has to be figured. It doesn't have to be transparent, so you can build a framework to support the mirror from behind or make the mirror out of a honeycomb-like material to uh, be lighter. Uh, and sometimes, they, they, back in the 60s or so, they were making mirrors out of something that looked like bathtub porcelain. They call it servit, and they, it was not transparent, but it didn't need to be. So uh, the, the mirror itself is on the surface, a little thin layer of aluminum overcoated for protection, 
And that's all you need for the making the mirror of a reflector telescope. Now, uh, if you have a great big telescope, like you'd find in an observatory, you can climb inside it with a camera or uh, certain eyepieces or uh, various scientific pieces of apparatus and observe from right inside the telescope. That's the way they do it at the big observatories. When you've got a, like a 16 foot mirror, then you're not occupying much of the space. But if this is say an eight inch telescope and you stick your head in it like that, you're not gonna see anything but a magnified image of your own eyeball. So what you have to do is to figure out a way to get the light where you can see it without blocking very much of it. And th this is something that uh, Isaac Newton came up with. Remember we sometimes talk about the balance between theoretical and practical in astronomy. I don't think anybody would uh, slight Newton the least for not being theoretical enough. He came up with many of the major theories that we still use today. Yet, he solved the problem of making a reflector telescope that you could actually look through. Some of the earlier ones have tilted mirrors and you had to look back, that causes distortion and so on. But he came up with the idea of putting the diagonal mirror here to reflect the light out to the side. And then you put your eyepiece here and look in it at right angles, as you can see in this particular telescope here. The mirror is down here and there's a diagonal mirror inside and it shoots the light out through the eyepiece holder where you put the various eyepieces for observing. Okay, we use the eyepiece. Okay, also with a, especially with a reflector telescope, you need to have a finder scope on it. Because if you're observing with a reflector, you can see you're looking at right angles to the way the telescope is aimed. That makes it hard to aim. So if you have a finder telescope on it, it's kind of like a, a sighting scope on a rifle. You look through it and it has crosshairs in it that you center on the target in the sky. And then you come around and look through the eyepiece. And if you have the finder properly aligned, it will be in the eyepiece. But that's uh, a necessity. Some people like to use a right angle finder. And I think we have, uh, well, these are some more examples of straight through finders. Uh, here's a little hole through the mounting of this one for rough alignment. Then you home in on it with the adjustment screws and then when it's on the telescope you can use it to aim the main telescope. Here, here's a right angle one and you can see that it's much easier to look through. You don't have to put your head down and look along the edge of the tube. But what happens? You're still wind up looking at a right angle to the direction the telescope is aimed. So you still need something to get the telescope aimed in approximately the right direction before that finder will even kick in. Uh, then another kind of uh, finder that comes with a lot of telescopes these days is a red dot virtual finder, which doesn't have any optics in it. All it has is a, kind of like a little slanted piece of a slightly frosted glass with a red beam aimed at it. And as you look through it, you see a little red dot projected into the sky. And if you can get that aligned with whatever it is you're looking at, then theoretically you're aimed at uh, the object you wanted to. The problem is, well, there are two problems. One is that it doesn't have any light gathering power. There's no, uh, there's no magnification and there's no increase in brightness because remember what's the purpose of a telescope? Gather light. This doesn't gather any light at all because it doesn't have any lenses. It's just like looking at the sky with your naked eye because you are, except that it's not quite that good because that little diagonal piece of glass in there blocks out some of the light. So what you see through it is actually a little bit dimmer than what it would be without it. But if you use your two eyes, you can do it. Yeah, right. Leave both eyes open. Uh, and you yeah, do. you have to get used to it, but it, you can use both eyes and that helps. Okay, so, and so the other is there's no magnification. A lot of times you need to see not only more light, but you just need to see a little bigger picture of what's there in the sky to match up with your star charts. So it doesn't do either one of those. 
reflectors, advantages and disadvantages. You frequently need to align them because anything that's adjustable will get out of adjustment. That's principle number two of the universe, I think, is if you can adjust it, it will need it. So not necessarily all the time, but they do get out of collimation or alignment and you will have to do it. Fortunately, it's not particularly hard to do if you know what you're doing and follow established procedures rather than just flailing around and doing random things that people tell you to do that don't seem to work. Maybe uh, sometime coming up this year, I might uh, be able to give a presentation on how to align a Newtonian telescope. The alignment is easy. And eventually, the mirror will need resurfacing. It's a little thin coating of aluminum and eventually that will corrode and need to be replaced. It slows it way down if you have a silicon monoxide coating on top of the aluminum, which doesn't affect the optical properties, but it keeps the aluminum from tarnishing. Uh, how long does it last? Well, this telescope was bought in 1957. Uh, again, the same month that I joined the Astronomical Society and two months after the Sputnik 1 was launched. And the uh, original coating is still on there. Not perfect, but it hasn't had to be replaced yet. I think, pretty sure it's going to outlast me, so I think all my coatings are coming off. <laughs> and low cost per inch of aperture or opening, because again, you can use uh, any kind of glass, make it a big piece, because you uh, only have to figure one side of it and uh, can support it from behind. So it's a uh, relatively low cost. And for that reason, you put your same amount of money. You're not going to save money on any kind of telescope. You just get a bigger one. If you get uh, something that's easier to make and less expensive per inch, you're just going to get more inches. So uh, I think the largest one in the society is 20 inches, but it used to be people made four and six inch telescopes was a standard. And then we had one member who broke through that and got, built an eight inch. And since then, they've just been going up and up and up. Now, what are these good for? Large dim objects, things that you need a lot of light for, because remember the purpose of the telescope is to gather light. So the uh, l more light gathering surface you have, the more faint objects you'll be able to see. And most of the, th this is one of the things you'll learn on observing sessions after you get through going through the moon and the planets, is that everything is dim and faint and fuzzy. And you'll need something that gathers a lot of light in order to make it uh, interesting to look at. So you, that's what a re big reflector telescope is good for. Nebula, we'll see some pictures of those in the second part of the program. Uh, gas clouds, galaxies, big pinwheel shaped groups of stars, island universes, and then little star clusters within our Milky Way galaxy. Those are what the reflector telescope is ideal for. What if you can't decide? Well, then you're just going to have to get both. And that's the catadioptric, the blended telescope, the hybrid that's uh, got the properties of both. You can have a large diameter and high power. And we'll see how that works in just a moment here, in fact, right now. The schmidt cassegrain telescope has a corrector plate in front and the main mirror in the back as usual and the secondary mirror which is attached with a little stalk to the back side of the corrector plate is convex and that causes the light that's converging to be not only reflected back but to be more uh, stretched out. You can see where the focal point of this mirror would be is right about here, right? You see where these lines would converge without it. But with this convex mirror, that spreads the light out to where it goes down for a much longer distance. And that, uh, what did we just do here? Uh, that uh, gives you the possibility of a very high magnification. Now, some people think that the high focal length or long focal length and high power of this is due to the fact that the light goes back and forth three times inside the tube. Well, it's not that simple. The main reason 
is the fact of this convex secondary mirror tricks your eye into thinking that you've got a much longer focal length. Picture your eye right there looking this way. Where, does that, where do these lines get up to that diameter? Well, way over here somewhere. So it makes it look to your eye as though you had a very long focal length when it's actually a trick by putting in the convex mirror in the middle of the light path. So that gives you high magnification with a rather, rather short tube and you can have a large diameter. So you can see you have all the advantages of a reflector gathering a lot of light and a refractor with the high power. Okay. It's the advantage is it's good for all types of observing, moon and planets or galaxies and nebulae. And it seldom needs alignment, which is good because you can't get to the main mirror. It's pretty much the way it is. Uh, the secondary mirror on the little stalk behind the corrector plate is observable, uh, adjustable rather. Uh, it's got three little set screws on it and occasionally it'll get out of adjustment since it's adjustable and you can uh, uh, collimate it with that. It's a relatively simple matter to do that. However, if anybody has one like that, I would suggest you replace the little Allen set screws that are in there with uh, neural knobs. You can get these uh, online called Bob's knobs. And uh, in the dark, you don't want to be coming at your corrector plate with a wrench or a screwdriver or even an Allen wrench. You're much better just to tweak it with the neural knobs on there. So Bob's knobs. I don't get a commission from him either. Okay, so you have to pay for that. So these are among the more expensive telescopes because you have the mirror and the corrector plate and uh, a secondary mirror has to be figured just right and uh, rather than just flat. So there, uh, some, that's the main drawback. But if money is no object, uh, then go right ahead. Uh, you buy some of them, they're not so hot. Uh, even with the good manufacturers, every now and then you'll get a dud, but they usually are pretty good about taking it back. If you prove that you've aligned it and it still doesn't work right, you can pretty much uh, get satisfied eventually. The main problem I've seen with these is around here in this part of the country, that corrector plate, which is the front end of the telescope, and a thin piece of glass dews up very quickly. Uh, now, dew is a relative term. Classical dew forms on the surface. When the surface gets below the dew point of the moisture in the air, then the air, which is, doesn't have little droplets in it, but when that air that has moisture in it touches the colder surface, then droplets of dew form on the surface. That's not just what we have around here. We have killer dew on steroids around here. You can see droplets in the air forming and aiming towards your telescope and collecting on it and dripping off. It's, uh, if you doubt me, just take one of your little pointers and point it up in the sky and you can see all those little shimmering droplets of water <coughs> headed for your corrector plate. So uh, there are ways to fix that. You can uh, put an extension on the tube uh, anything from a grocery sack held on with a rubber band to uh, a specially made device that slips right on it for that particular brand of telescope and no other. Or you can wrap a heater around the front end of it, a little heating tape. Now you don't want it to get hot. That causes heat waves and air currents and all of that. In fact, all you want to do is bring it up to the air temperature because the front end of that telescope, if you're observing on a clear night, which is what we tend to do, the telescope and everything else radiates its heat and warmth out into space and winds up getting cooler than the surrounding air, which is why the dew or whatever this stuff is forms on it. So if you can just bring it back up to the ambient temperature, then the dew won't form on there. So uh, if it feels hot, you're not doing it right. Okay, some information about all different types of telescopes that you will uh, need to know in order to uh, 
get started. First, the magnification. That's not one of the, like I said, it's even comes in a distant second as the purpose of the telescope. Gathering light is the main purpose. You still, most of the time, want to magnify the image some so it isn't tiny, but it's greatly overrated. Uh, a lot of times that will be the main advertising point in a department store telescope. You go in and see this little uh, modest size refractor telescope in a box and it'll say 600x on it. For, it's supposed to magnify things 600 times. Well, it can, but you can't use it. Suppose you could theoretically get your car to go 300 miles an hour. Uh, that's not necessarily what you'd want to do, and it's generally not a good idea. And the same goes with the telescope. We'll see exactly how that works in just a moment. The power of a telescope is adjustable. So if you have a telescope, surely someone has asked you what power is it? Uh, that's one of the most frequent questions that you will get is what power is the telescope? Again, using the analogy, how fast is your car? Well, depends on where you are, what you're doing, and what you think you can get away with. And that all applies to astronomical telescopes as well. The, te the power is adjustable using the eyepiece. The power is this simple equation, the focal length of the objective, whether it's a lens and a refractor or a mirror and a telescope. This mirror has a 48 inch focal length. And if you can spend a week's salary on a box for your eyepieces, I never did. Uh, here's an eyepiece and you put that into the eyepiece holder and voila, the telescope is complete. Or you can put a different eyepiece in and you have the, a different magnification. And we'll see how the equation works in some examples here. The focal length of the main lens or mirror is shown here. The focal length of the eyepiece is there. And when you put the two focal lengths at exactly the same spot, the telescope is in focus and the parallel rays of light coming into the telescope will come out parallel into your eyes. If you have it at any other spot, it won't, that will not prevail and the image will look fuzzy or out of focus as we say. Uh, how does this work by the way? How does that focal length do? This is another trick for your eye. Consider that you're back here looking this way. You're looking into a bundle of light that's that big in diameter. But you think it's that big because it's stepped up by the two lenses. So the ratio of this size to that size is the power of the telescope. How much the bundle of light is expanded by looking through the telescope. The thing is, those are not easy to measure, especially on an eyepiece. It turns out that the focal length is since these are similar triangles, this focal length to that focal length is the same as that diameter to that diameter. So we just set it up with the ratio of the focal lengths instead. The, any telescope you buy has got the focal length stamped on the side of it. Any eyepiece you buy has the focal length engraved on it as well. So the ratio of those two numbers gives you the power of the telescope. So you adjust the eyepieces and change the power by doing that. The shorter the focal length of the eyepiece, the higher the power. So as you can see in the equation, the, you put a smaller number in here, that divided into this fixed number gives you a higher power. Or if you look at it this way, if you had a smaller bundle of light coming out here, the step up is greater to here. So again, the ratio of the size of the light bundle or the focal length gives you the magnification of the telescope. Here's a sort of based on this telescope, a 48 inch focal length and here's a half inch eyepiece, 12 and a half millimeters. The caution is they have to be in the same units. You can't use the focal length of one in inches and the other in millimeters or you'll wind up with uh, something really screwy. So, uh, okay, this is a half inch eyepiece. 
So if we put that half inch in the diameter of the 48 inch focal length, you'll see 96 power for the telescope as set up like that. And that's all there is to it for figuring up the power of a telescope. Now, which ones do you want to use? We'll get into that right away. First of all, there is a practical limit 50 power per inch. Some people will go as high as 60 power per inch, but not any more than that. Which means that if you have a two and a quarter inch refractor, which is a standard department store size, you're going to be limited to 113 power, not 600. Now, if you put a short enough eyepiece in there, it will be 600, but what happens? The image pretty much disappears. If, consider this projector here. How could we make this image bigger? Well, we could back the projector up to the back of the room and of course the image would get bigger. What if we took it all the way across the street to the fairgrounds and projected against the outside wall of this building? It'd be really huge, wouldn't it? But do you think you could see it? The same amount of light is coming out of the projector, but it's, ex but it's spread out over such a huge area that there's nothing left to see. And that's what happens if you try to use, that's one of the things that happens when you try to use too much magnification, is the image does get bigger, but it also tends to disappear if you go more than this uh, 50 or 60 power per inch rule. So uh, you'll be a lot happier if you use the lower powers. Nine times out of 10, when somebody calls me up to come visit their sick telescope, they got it, put it together, and it isn't working. They've put in the highest power eyepiece, the finder's not lined up, and uh, they're not really sure what they're looking at, and you can guarantee that no matter what you aim it at, you're not going to see much of anything. You can aim it straight at the moon, and you might see a little shimmering ghost-like something go by, but anything else disappears because you've magnified the light up to where it's not existent anymore. So nearly always, low magnification is more useful than high power. Uh, again, using the car analogy, uh, your speedometer indicates maybe 120, 130 miles an hour. How many of you have ever seen that? You're lucky around town to go 30, 40, 50, highways, 60, 70, 80, something like that. And it's uh, just a whole lot easier to use when you're using the lower end of the power or speed range. Limiting magnitude. Okay, we might have a term here that not everybody's familiar with, and that's magnitude. That's the term astronomers use for the brightness of an object, in this case, as it appears in the sky. The brightest stars are around first magnitude, and the faintest ones you can see with your unaided eye are sixth magnitude. And of course, the second, third, fourth, and fifth in between. Some things, like some of the planets, are so bright that they actually wind up having a negative magnitude, and two stars have a negative magnitude. But generally, the range is first to sixth, and it's pretty much a hundredfold difference in brightness between the brightest stars and the faintest ones you can see. So, if the telescope is your eye, your limiting magnitude is six, just to use this terminology. Now, since the purpose of the telescope is to gather light, you can see fainter objects with it. And the formula for doing that is relatively straightforward. The limiting magnitude is nine plus five times the log of the diameter of the telescope in inches. Now, everybody's calculator's got a log key on it. Most people have never used it, don't even know what it's for or how it works or anything. We'll leave out most of that. We're just going to punch the button here. It's an exponent of 10, but you don't need to know that. So if you put the diameter of the telescope into the calculator, hit the log button, then times 5 plus 9, just work through the equation backwards, and it will give you the uh, limiting magnitude of what you can see with your telescope. Here's uh, an example. 4-inch telescope, log of 4 is 0 0.602. We used to have to memorize all those numbers. Uh, so, and then 5 times that is 3, add to the 9 is 12. So if you have a 4-inch telescope, 
telescope, you can see six, uh, uh, 12th magnitude objects, which is big improvement over six, because it's not linear, though. That's a logarithmic scale. So a uh, 12th magnitude object is way, way, way fainter than a sixth. And when you go to look for a particular object, like say the ring nebula or some faint pair of galaxies, it will always tell you what the magnitude is in the table that goes with the star chart. So if it's uh, fainter than what uh, your telescope is capable of, just go on to something else because you might be in the right spot, but you won't see it if the telescope won't gather enough light to tickle your retinas into observing. Okay, uh, this, this is kind of an aside here. The focal ratio of the mirror of a telescope for those of you who are familiar with cameras and how they work and the various specifications, this may tie into something you know. If not, just tune out for a second, check your emails, and so on. Uh, if we divide the focal length by the diameter, that gives you the F ratio or the speed of the telescope's objects, optics. Um, if you have a 48-inch focal length and a 6-inch mirror, 48 divided by 6 is F8. If you have a, a smaller F number, that means the, for all everything else being equal, you get a lower magnification, wider field of view, and a brighter the image for extended objects, uh, not star points, but with any given eyepiece or camera. Same as with the camera. If you stop down a camera from F1.4 to F11, the images are going to be dimmer because you've uh, you haven't changed the focal length of the camera, but you've changed the diameter of the lens by stopping down the iris in the front of the lens. So if that made sense to you, fine. If not, it's not truly necessary. But when you go to buy a telescope, they will show this in the catalog. F4 to 5 uh, focal ratios are good for low power, wide field ob observing. F11, which is this one, to F15, which some refractors are, uh, gives you a narrow field but tends to give you higher powers for lunar planetary work. And the ones in between are suitable either way, but again, not ideal, but it's better than having to carry two telescopes around depending on what you want to look at. Now the last part is on the types of mountings. This is one of the most important parts of a telescope. It does you no good to have a perfect optical telescope if the mounting is floppy and unreliable. It's sort of like having a, a sports car with a 300 horsepower engine, but the wheels tend to fall off. So it's not any good if the thing that's holding it up is not uh, supportive of the optics. So you've got to have a good mounting. There are several types. The two basic types are altazimuth, whoops, and where did I go? Okay, the basic types are altazimuth and equatorial, and we'll get into those. And each one of those is roughly subdivided into two kinds. There, there are more, but this is enough for uh, getting started with. So we'll look at each one of those. Altazimuth means, the alt part means up and down, and the azimuth means around the horizon or back and forth. So here are telescopes with altazimuth mountings. You can see this one pivots around the top of the tripod so it can aim left and right, and it also pivots up here where the tube is attached so it can go up and down. So that's an altazimuth mounting. The Dobsonian telescope is made like that as well. The back and forth motion is right on the ground. It's like a lazy Susan turntable that the whole telescope sits on and it rotates around that to give you the back and forth motion. And then where the tube is held at the top of the mount, it lets you move it up and down. Here's a much more expensive version of the same thing with a fork mount that again, rotates around the top of the mounting of the tripod and then the tube itself is held so that it can move up and down. The standard altazimuth mounting is this type that's uh, 
just moves around in a circle and up and down. This one is a little fancier because it has some knobs that allow you to make fine adjustments horizontally and vertically rather than just jerking it around because that tends to not be satisfactory when you're uh, already in a fairly high magnification and you jerk it just a little bit and it goes out the other side and then you go back. By that time it's moved a little bit so you have to start over. So the knobs help you with the uh, moving in the altazimuth mount. The Dobsonian mount is same principle, but the structure and layout are entirely different. The telescope itself uh, turns on its base around the horizontal, uh, around a vertical axis, but in the horizontal plane, and then the pivot point here lets it go up and down. They're simple and tend to be fairly sturdy, but for astronomical purposes, there are a couple of drawbacks. A lot of people get used to using them, but the, there are two main problems. It's when you go to track an object as it moves across the sky, they don't move up and down or back and forth generally. It's always at a slant, sometimes a curve. And therefore, you need some kind of a mounting that helps you track with one motion rather than having to seesaw and zigzag back and forth. Ever seen pictures like this before? This is what you would get if you were in a very dark location and opened up your camera lens aimed straight north at the North Star, which you can see is almost but not quite straight north. And left the lens open for looks like about six hours, about a fourth of a day. And as the Earth rotates eastward, the stars appear to move westward. I think my fingers are too fat for this, these buttons is the problem here. Oh. I have a problem with my text. Oh. <laughs> well, I haven't run into that yet. <laughs> okay, so things move around and you can see that if you're tracking a star through here, you'd have to go down and left and down and left, whereas one over here, you'd have to go right and up and right and up in order to track it in its motion. And that's a little uh, tricky to do. Even ones that are along the celestial equator that move pretty much in straight lines. The straight lines are not straight up and down or back and forth except at the equator. Uh, does anybody know what we're looking at here? That's Orion. That's Orion. Yeah, look at just the ends of the line. Don't try to figure out the whole smear there. See those three in a row? That's Orion's belt, and that's Betelgeuse in his shoulder, and Rigel in his heel, and that's the Orion Nebula. And then Sirius is down here, the brightest star. So that's, we're looking at the sky uh, about last, last month is what this would look like. But again, tracking with this, you would have to go up and right and up and right and up and right which at a low power isn't bad, especially if you're looking at the moon and it's bright, and if you lose it, you can find it again. But if you spent a half hour finding something, you don't want to have to zigzag to chase it down. And sometimes it's more difficult to find the objects in the first place because your star charts are laid out, uh, not the little simple one I'm going to give you tonight, but one in an actual book of star charts are laid out according to the celestial coordinates with north and south lines and east and west lines on it. So if you see that one object is straight south of another object and you get on this first one, you should be able to go straight south and get to it. The thing is straight south is probably not straight up and down or back and forth. It's going to be at an angle. So you need a mount that will let you go in that direction to find it in the first place and then to track it. And you know, you can't make a rule about this because there's this Jeremy. Uh, he's found, I think, all the objects in the Messier catalog using an altazimuth mount, so it can be done. But it would have been easier if you'd had an equatorial mount. <laughs> 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 yeah. But it would have been, uh, it would have been, it would have been a, a lot heavier, a yes. 20-inch telescope. Yeah. Yeah, when we look at the equatorial mount, you'll see how that works there. So whatever type of mounting you use, it's got to be sturdy uh, and not shaky. And it's better to have a sturdy altazimuth mount than a shaky equatorial mount any day. 
Okay, looking at equatorial mountings, this consists of two axles at right angles to each other so that any object in the sky can be seen. And let me see if I can weight lift this up a little bit here. Can you see the two axes, this one and this one, that are at right angles to each other? That's the essence of the equatorial mounting. So the motions would go north and south, which in astronomy we call declination, and east and west, which we call right ascension. So if we want to move towards the south, we just turn like this. And notice it's moving at a slanting angle. In other words, away from Polaris. If you've got really wide angle vision, you could see Polaris back here. You'll see that when I'm doing this, we're aiming the telescope increasingly away from the North Star, which by definition is going south. And towards it is going north. And at right angles to that is west or east along the other axis. So you can see that it's with those two angles or axes at right angles to each other and one of them aimed at the North Star, then any motion you do on the telescope is going to automatically be north, south, or east, west which is, makes finding things easier and tracking them much easier. Okay, we've already seen about finding and tracking. We've already talked about that. The German equatorial mount, which this is, and the fork on the wedge. Sounds like a salad of some kind, but this, maybe I should have had supper first. Okay, here's a German equatorial mount. Here are the, there's the polar axis and there's the declination axis. And the polar axis and declination axis on this one, and you've seen them on my little telescope. And you have to adjust the polar axis so that it's aimed at the North Star, the North Celestial Pole, which is the same as your latitude. So you set that, line, that angle for 35 degrees at Memphis and it's aimed automatically at the North Star when you aim the whole thing towards the North. Here's uh, the fork on the equatorial wedge. First, here's the fork not on an equatorial wedge. We showed this a little earlier. The telescope turns around on this uh, horizontally with this uh, bearing right on top of the tripod, and then it moves up and down on these bearings right there. Well, you've got two axes at right angles to each other with that kind of telescope, don't you? It's just that this one isn't aimed at the North Star unless you aim it at the North Star by tilting it. So you stick a wedge-shaped piece of metal in here, and when that happens, here's the top of this axis right here, here it is right here. And now it is aimed at the North Star, so this becomes the polar axis rather than just the azimuth axis, and this becomes the declination axis rather than just the uh, altitude axis. So you could turn, uh, Alta azimuth mount that has two right angle axes into an equatorial just by tilting it. And that's what the fork on the wedge is. A little more weight to carry around. Uh, before I get onto it, let me just point out something about the German equatorial mount. The way this is set up with the polar axis and the telescope on one side, you have to balance it with weights on the other side. Not necessarily quite as heavy is these, but if it's on a shorter axis here, it'd have to be heavier. In other words, this distance times that weight's got to equal that weight times that distance. Um, which means you're carrying around about twice as much stuff as if you didn't have an equatorial mount. So that is definitely a downside. Now if the whole thing weighs 25, it's little buzzing noises as you enter the object's coordinates or whatever it uh, Okay, get back to where we were here. Okay, yeah, the little handheld computer that I did not hit that button. I did not hit it then. It's, it's haunted. It's haunted. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Just keep in mind that if you buy a telescope with a computer, a sizable portion of the money you're spending is going into the computer rather than the optics and the mounting. So if you want to get a pure telescope, you can do that and then hook up something <laughs> to it later or just actually learn how to find things without using the computer, which is what we'll go into in the second half of the program. Okay, you do have to enter your position. Uh, some of them are, have GPS and can do that by itself, but somehow you have to tell it where you are and where it is and find two or three stars in the sky, which, so you still have to know something. And uh, that's what most people are doing these days, though. It's not, uh, not necessarily bad, because it's better than just sitting inside watching TV, but it's a whole different experience. Okay, now this part that I'm gonna show you is basically how to set up a telescope but we'll go through that with your telescopes out in the lobby during the break. So these are all things that seem really obvious, but they're not because I didn't do them that way at first. These are all based on mistakes that I've made over the years. Set up the tripod or pedestal first. For those of you who are here early, you notice I brought in the tripod and set it up and then put the telescope on it. That's the recommended order of doing things. It sure works better that way. Make sure all the screws and knobs and everything on the tripod are sturdy so that it doesn't flop around when you put the telescope on it. No wobbling. If you have the German equatorial mounting, put the counterweight on it first before you put the telescope on. Otherwise, it'll flop over and break something. Then you fasten the telescope, and there are usually three different ways to do it. One, this one has bolts that come through the telescope and into the mounting and you put wing nuts on them. Others have straps that you wrap around the scope and tighten. Some of them have uh, clamps that uh, sort of fit around the tube and then you tighten those down. But whatever it is, fasten it onto the mounting. Then if you have an adjustable tripod, adjust the legs of the tripod to a convenient length. Again, it's a compromise. The longer they're extended, the higher up it will be, and usually the easier it is to look through, but the more wobbly it is. If you shorten them down, you may have to kneel on the ground for some observations, but it'll be a lot steadier, unless you're three feet tall, and then there's no problem. Okay, on the altazimuth mounting, there's not much you can adjust, although possibly the tension on the uh, knob so that you basically want to be able to aim the telescope anywhere in the sky easily and then have it stay put when you let go of it so somebody else can take a turn looking and they don't have to re-find it. So if it flops down then you need to tighten it up a little bit. But those are about the only uh, adjustments you need. For equatorial mounting you have to aim the polar axis at the North Star you can generally get it close enough just eyeballing it. You get where you can see the North Star, stand there behind the telescope, and turn the mounting around to where it's aimed towards the north. And uh, if you have a, a little, some telescopes come with a little sighting telescope built into the polar axis. You can look through that and see the North Star through it. Well, that's really deluxe, and you can do that. Or you can take the polar axis out and just look through the housing of it and sight through that at the North Star. There are any number of ways to do it just to make it uh, go north. And adjust it up and down to where it really is aimed at the North Star. If you haven't already done it with a protractor or a scale built onto the base already. Like this, for example. Here's one that's got a numbered scale. I'm sure you can't read it from back there. I can't even read it from here. But that's the Latit uh, the scale for the latitude of your observing site, which is the same as the how you the, the North Star. I think you maybe see that in a little bit. You can at least see where it says latitude scale. So that's, uh, that's what that is. You aim it to where it's equal to your latitude. Um, so, okay, that's what you do if you have done that. Um, and if you do this outside, you're already aimed at the North Star and are ready to go. Now, then you've got to balance it. Turn the telescope so the declination axis is horizontal. 
like this. And you adjust it to where it will stay put when you turn it uh, one way or the other. Uh, depending on what size eyepiece or if you have a camera or something in it. Those of you who have the kind of telescope that can slide in the rings or straps have an advantage of, over this type where it's uh, bolted in, but you can adjust it. You, you don't want it to where it flops around. Get it where it's sturdy that way. Then you do the same thing in the other direction with the polar axis. You can get it out to the side and make sure that when you let go of it, it stays put wherever you aim it. And you adjust that with the counterweight sliding up and down. Just make sure that if you adjust the counterweight, you tighten it back up securely so it doesn't slide off in the dark and break your toe and then the telescope falls over. Uh, some have a little uh, flange at the bottom of the uh, declination axis that keeps the counterweight from falling off. Don't ever take that off. Just uh, leave that on there as a safety net. Okay, so we're balancing it in all directions. Okay, yeah, we've already covered that. Then, you've got to align the finder scope, aim at something nearby during the daytime, like the top of a tree or a chimney or a radio tower, and make sure that when you get it into the eyepiece field of the telescope, use the lowest power first, as always, and then uh, aim the finder with its adjusting screws until it's uh, also on the crosshairs of the finder. You can do a lot of that in the daytime to get the rough adjustments done. And then uh, when, you get, when you get that done, aim it at something that's farther away, get to more and more distant objects, and then wind up at night using the, uh, a star to line on. Preferably one kind of near the North Star so it doesn't move much. If you start looking near the celestial equator, by the time you adjust it right in the finder and then go around to the eyepiece, it's going to have moved some anyway. So make sure that you uh, aim it kind of near the pole so there's not a lot of motion going on. Now, a lot of finders don't have good adjustments. The uh, old timey best ones are like this have two sets of three screws. So you can hold it in place with the front ones and then the back ones you tighten and loosen until the whole scope moves around and aims where you want. The uh, best new kind is held in the front by kind of a rubber O-ring so that it can move but it doesn't flop around. And then you have two screws at right angles in the back. One for a... Uh, 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 perpendicular to the scope, one parallel to it. So when you have it like that, you only have a, a little, and it's spring-loaded, so it doesn't, you don't have to keep tightening and loosening things. It works really well that way. Some really good new ones are like that. Uh, if you have a wobbly finder, you got to fix it before you start observing, or you will just uh, start cursing or thinking you of unpleasant thoughts uh, about your telescope and the world in general and you go out and the telescope is you're trying to find something but the finder flops around that just isn't any good you can fix it by wrapping tape around the front to hold it still cram it into the mounting and then use the adjustment screws to aim it so uh, you know what mine is right be sure the encoder bolts are all tight oh yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, otherwise it'll be trying to correct for things. Looking at the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rick is high tech and I'm low tech. So there's no, no one will argue with that. Okay, finish up using a high power eyepiece, one of your shorter ones, and make sure that if it's on the crosshairs in the finder, then it's uh, in the center of the eyepiece, and then you'll be a lot happier. And every minute you spend doing that will save hours of frustration out in the field. Okay, um, I'll just come out and say it. I don't think you'll have much luck with only a right angle finder. If you're really committed to having a right angle finder, you're going to need another something like maybe the red dot thing to aim it. Uh, so you wind up with a series of finders. Sort of like Belloc's poem about fleas. 
Remember that one? Large fleas have smaller fleas upon their backs to bite them. These smaller fleas have lesser fleas and so on ad infinitum. So you have to have a, a right angle finder because it gives you a nice view with a convenient angle, but then you have to have a finder for that finder so that you can see where it's aimed. Okay. Okay. So with, uh, with that, we will adjourn to the uh, lobby for those of you who brought your telescopes. And then by far the shorter part of the meeting is the second half where we look at how to actually find things. But first, we'll give you help in setting up your uh, telescope. And those of you who ask any of us will get an opinion and whoever, however many people you ask, you'll get that many opinions. But, okay, thank you. Okay.